Britain is one of the world's greatest users of electricity. Our dependence on electricity begins the day we're born and continues throughout the rest of our lives. Without electricity, we stop. The lights go out. So we must look at the best way of maintaining the supply. Electricity is generated from many different sources. Right now, over 12% of our electricity, that's one-eighth, comes from nuclear power. Britain has always been a world leader in this field, and there have been nuclear power stations running successfully and safely in the UK for more than 20 years. As nuclear fuel is relatively cheap and plentiful, it can play an increasingly valuable role in ensuring our future power supply. Another advantage of nuclear fuel is that it can be reused. Just off the north coast of Wales on the island of Anglesey is the Wilver nuclear power station. It's one of the largest of its kind in the British Isles and produces 840 megawatts of electricity. That's enough to supply the total needs of two cities the size of Liverpool. The fuel used at Wilver and other nuclear stations is uranium and it's delivered by lorry on average about once a week. A coal-fired station with the same output would need something like seven trainloads of coal per day. That's about 10 miles of train every week. So, apart from its other benefits, nuclear fuel certainly puts less of a burden on the country's transportation system. The heart of any nuclear power station is the reactor. This building houses two reactors, in which the uranium is used to produce energy. The uranium is contained in an alloy can. It's called a fuel element and there are many thousands of them in the reactor. At this stage, before it goes into the reactor, the element has very little radioactivity and can be handled in complete safety. The gloves are purely to keep it clean. Some 40 feet below this concrete floor is the reactor, where the uranium burns up, gradually reducing in efficiency. It remains in the reactor for several years, after which it must be replaced. But the uranium still contains lots of energy, and it can be reprocessed to create new supplies. Doing this, also reduces the amount of waste. Using TV monitoring and remote handling equipment, the used elements are removed from the reactor with care as they are now highly radioactive and also give off heat. Several feet of water provides a very effective radiation shield. So at most nuclear power stations, like here at Oldbury, they are stored underwater in special cooling ponds for a minimum of three months during which time the elements cool down and most of the initial high radioactivity dies away. However, even after this period, the used nuclear fuel is still radioactive, so it can't be treated lightly. To transport it from power station to processing plant, often a distance of hundreds of miles, requires special treatment. You can't just pop it in the post. It must be held safely in special containers like this. It's called a flask, which is a strange word to use, as flasks are generally made of glass and can be held in the hand. However, this flask is made of steel and weighs over 50 tons. Basically, it's a huge box with walls 370 millimeters thick. That's 14 and a half inches of very high-grade steel. The manufacture of such heavy-duty containers is quite a difficult process, which combines the traditional skills of the craftsman with the latest developments in metallurgy. 
At every stage, there are checks for flaws, cracks, or impurities. Among the advanced methods used is ultrasonic testing, which will detect minute flaws throughout the full thickness of the flask walls. When the basic steel box has been completed, special fins are welded on. These help dissipate the small amount of heat coming from the contained fuel and keep the flask at the desired handling temperature. So far, we've dealt only with the body of the flask. But equally important is the other main component, the lid. This again is of massive construction. It alone weighs nearly seven tons. And when it's lowered into place, the joint is sealed by a pair of very carefully designed sealing rings. The lid is firmly secured by 16 of these heavy-duty bolts, each of which is capable on its own of bearing a load of 150 tons. So, that's the flask, a massive steel safe with two vital functions to perform. The first is to protect the public by safely containing the used fuel during transportation. The record on this point is a good one. Flasks similar to this one in over 20 years have made more than 5,000 journeys without a single instance of flask failure. Each flask design meets internationally agreed standards. Safety pins out, stand by. Drop tests onto a massive steel-clad concrete target using quarter-scale flasks provide the engineers with the information necessary to ensure that every flask will withstand a major impact. A flask also has to be able to survive the effect of a 30-minute fire at a temperature of at least 800 degrees centigrade. The design and the use of the flasks is independently assessed and approved by the Department of Transport. The purpose of impact and fire testing is to ensure that the flasks will withstand severe accidents without significant leakage. The other function of the flask is to absorb the radiation produced by the used fuel. This has considerable penetrating power and is potentially harmful. Each element is made up of a uranium bar packaged in an alloy can, several hundred of which constitute a fuel load for transportation. They are held in a skip and immersed in water, which has the effect of absorbing some of the radiation and conducting heat outwards. Finally, the whole lot is encased within the flask wall. This huge steel mass reduces the radiation to a level which is perfectly safe to stand beside and handle. The system of loading the flask varies somewhat at different power stations. Here at Oldbury, the whole operation is carried out in the cooling pond using remote handling equipment. The skip containing the used elements is put into the flask and the lid placed in position. The flask is lifted out of the pond and up into the spray ring, where it's thoroughly washed with fresh water. The next stage is for the flask to be transferred from the pond area into the inspection bay, where the lid is securely bolted down. The flask then undergoes extensive testing to make sure that it's properly closed and sealed. The whole flask is given a thorough washdown with a decontamination solution. It's then rinsed off and allowed to dry. The flask is checked with radiological instruments and swab samples are taken and checked with radiation counters. All these checks combine to ensure that the flask is completely sealed and safe. It's only then that the flask is allowed to start its journey to the reprocessing plant at Sellafield in Cumbria.
a purpose-built road vehicle carries the flask on the first part of that journey from the power station to the railhead. So here we are at the railhead. Well, the flask will now be transferred from the road transporter to a purpose-built rail wagon. The flask will remain on its wagon throughout its journey and en route will be coupled with flask wagons from other stations. This makes the most economic use of the British Rail Service. Some flasks now have special covers fitted over them. One of the benefits is that it stops the flask collecting traffic dirt and thus reduces the problem of cleaning it at the end of its journey. I'm now in one of the signal boxes along the route and with me is Alec Wise, Operating Superintendent of the Preston Division of London Midland Region. The safety record for the carriage of all types of goods on the railways of this country is probably as good as any in the world. How do you achieve this? Well, we operate very differently to many other countries in that we run much smaller trains and we supervise them more closely. In addition to that, we segregate the various commodities on a train and maintain the track over which these freight trains run to passenger standards. Here in our control office, we can monitor the progress of the flask on our computer and provide information for our controllers of the formations of all trains carrying all types of traffic along the route. But what would happen if there was an incident involving a train with a flask? The guard or driver can quickly contact the nearest signal box using the line side telephone systems and we can then call out all the necessary emergency services including specialist staff from the nearest nuclear establishment. But as you know, in the last 20 years or so that we have been carrying used nuclear fuel, we have not had an incident involving the release of radioactivity. And we are confident that our safety arrangements are such that we will be able to maintain this creditable record in the future. So there we are, another flask nears its destination. With more time, money and expertise devoted to ensuring the safety of nuclear material in transit than any other substance, it's not surprising that this and every other consignment of used fuel will complete a safe journey. <laughs>